Next year marks the 100th anniversary of Einstein's discovery of his general theory of relativity. This is an amazing theory of gravity. It predicts that light is bent when it passes by a massive object like the sun. This was first seen in 1919, and this early confirmation of his theory made Einstein famous. Those early measurements were not very accurate, but by today we have confirmation of Einstein's prediction to better than a hundredth of a percent. But what really makes general relativity amazing is its intimate connection with space and time. The key idea of general relativity is that matter causes space and time to stretch and warp. And gravity is nothing but objects responding to that curvature of space that they feel. A standard way to picture this is to think of space as a rubber sheet. If you put a heavy ball in the center of the sheet, it will, of course, bend down. If you then take a lighter object like a marble and roll it on the sheet, it will be deflected just because of the curvature of space that it feels. Well, this is like the Earth in being a heavy object and curving the space around it. And the moon is like the marble in orbit around the Earth just because of the curved space created by the Earth. But general relativity says that matter also warps time. Time actually runs slower next to a massive object. You are aging less living here on the surface of the Earth than if you were living out in space. Of course, the effect is very small, only about one second every year. But it's been measured using very accurate atomic clocks. In fact, this effect has not only been measured, it has practical applications. The global positioning system, which allows you to locate your uh, position anywhere on the surface of the Earth, wouldn't work unless relativistic effects were taken into account. The GPS consists of 24 satellites in orbit around the Earth. Each one is equipped with a very accurate atomic clock. These satellites continuously send out information about their location and what time their clock says. A GPS receiver on, on the Earth then collects signals from at least four of these satellites. And from that information can tell you where you're located and what time it is. Now, general relativity, of course, also predicts the existence of black holes. Like everything else, stars are born and die. They're born when a large cloud of gas starts to collapse under its gravitational attraction. And as it collapses, it starts to heat up. Eventually, the temperature in the center of that um, gas cloud becomes hot enough that nuclear reactions take place, and hydrogen is turned into helium. That heats up the gas cloud even more, and you get a star, which is just a hot ball of gas, which supports itself against gravitational collapse by ordinary hot gas pressure. Now, stars can live for millions and billions of years, but eventually they use up their nuclear fuel. And when that happens, they continue to collapse under the effect of gravity. The gravitational force at the surface of the star gets greater and greater. And for a sufficiently massive star, the collapse will just continue until the gravitational force becomes so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape. And you form a black hole. The surface of the black hole, marking the point of no return, is called the event horizon. Now, you have to be quite close to a black hole in order to feel its enormous gravitational pull. If the sun was to turn into a black hole tomorrow, the orbit of the Earth would not be affected a bit. Of course, it would get very cold very quickly. You might wonder how we detect black holes, since they're black and don't emit any light. But the point is that when matter falls onto a black hole, it gains a lot of energy and starts to radiate. And we can see that radiation. Now, astronomers have found that not only do we have black holes about the mass of a star, there are supermassive black holes living in the center of galaxies. These are millions to billions of times larger than a solar mass black hole. These black holes rotate and power enormous jets which come out of the galaxy. The idea is that when matter falls toward the black hole, before it actually enters the black hole, it gets shot out along the axis of rotation, forming these enormous jets. And in fact, these supermassive black holes are believed to power the most energetic phenomenon in the universe. Now, the story I've been telling you is the standard story of black holes according to general relativity. But it's not quite the whole story. In the 1970s, Stephen Hawking showed that when you include the quantum effects of matter, black holes are not really black. They have a temperature. 
and they radiate heat. Now, heat, of course, carries energy, and energy is the same as mass. That's that other thing that Einstein did, E equals mc squared. So if no matter falls onto a black hole, a black hole will actually lose its mass and will eventually evaporate. Now, about 15 years ago, we discovered that general relativity was not just a theory of gravity. This came out of developments in string theory and was a complete surprise. String theory is a newer theory which combines general relativity with quantum theory and also includes the other forces of nature. For over 80 years, we had thought of general relativity as a theory of gravity. But string theory says that under the right conditions, general relativity can also describe non-gravitational phenomena. In order to do this, you have to translate the results of general relativity and its language in terms of gravity into an appropriate language for the non-gravitational phenomenon you want to study. For example, the temperature of an ordinary system is modeled in general relativity by a black hole with that temperature. Now, it's not yet clear what class of non-gravitational phenomenon general relativity can describe. It's been shown that it can describe ordinary fluids. And we decided to see if it could describe something called a superconductor. Now, just a few years before Einstein discovered his general theory of relativity, um, people discovered that if you take ordinary metals and cool them down to very cold temperatures, they will conduct electricity with no loss of energy at all. The resistance goes completely to zero, and you get something known as a superconductor. And just 25 years ago, a new class of materials were found, which become superconductors at higher temperatures. The original superconductors have been understood for a long time, but these newer materials are much more complicated and still quite mysterious. Well, we found that by doing calculations in general relativity involving black holes, we could reproduce all the basic properties of superconductors. It turns out that in order to do this, you need a black hole to have static matter just sitting outside the event horizon. Black holes don't usually want to do this. If you have matter outside the black hole, it wants to fall in. But we found that when you use the conditions suggested by string theory, this is possible. And you do have black holes with matter. And furthermore, when you calculate the resistance by perturbing the black hole and translating the results using um, the sort of rules given by string theory, you reproduce the properties of superconductors. There's a critical temperature. And above this temperature, the black hole has no matter outside, and the resistance is non-zero. But below this temperature, the black hole develops matter outside, and the resistance goes to zero. I've been studying general relativity my whole life, and I never dreamed that it knew anything about superconductivity. But it gets better. If you take two superconductors and separate them just by a narrow gap, you form something called a Josephson junction. These have a number of applications, including um, allowing you to make object, uh, measure, very precise measurements of magnetic fields. We decided to see if general relativity could reproduce the properties of a Josephson junction and found that it can. So what I'm showing here is a uh, picture from our numerical solution of general relativity. We've arranged the black hole so that it's superconducting both on the left and on the right. And the plot shows the matter outside the horizon of the black hole. You see the matter is non-zero on the left and the right. But in the gap in the middle when the black hole is not a superconductor, this matter goes to zero. And this plot shows the current across the junction as a function of some property of the superconductor. The red dots are the results of our calculations involving general relativity. And the solid black line is the expected behavior of a standard Josephson junction. And you see there's beautiful agreement. Now we decided to get a little more ambitious. Having seen that general relativity could reproduce qualitative properties of superconductors, we asked ourselves if it could possibly reproduce quantitatively some mysterious property of these new higher temperature superconductors. So this is one of those mysterious properties. Um, this is data taken on one of these new materials at four different temperatures. These are all temperatures above the point where the material becomes a superconductor. So the material is, quote, in its normal phase. But you notice 
It doesn't matter exactly what is being plotted here, but what is important is that those four lines of four different temperatures all agree on the right-hand side of the diagram. And it's not understood why it has that regularity. When we went to general relativity, we found exactly the same thing. We found an appropriate black hole, computed the same thing that's being measured, this plot shows our results from our calculations at four different temperatures above the point where the black hole is a superconductor. And once again, we found that all four lines agree on the right-hand side of the diagram. And the slope is exactly the same as what's seen in the real materials. I mean, we were amazed when we saw this. This slope is robust. It doesn't come, it's not put in. It doesn't change when you change the parameters of our model. Now, I have to caution you that it's not exactly the same. There are some differences between what we calculate in general relativity and what's seen in the real material. But the agreement of the slope is striking. And we really don't understand why it's working so well. If you lower the temperature to below the point where the material becomes superconducting, nothing changes. Here's data from eight related materials with lots of lines showing temperatures both above the point where they're superconducting and below the point where they're superconducting. And you see that the lines all agree on the right-hand side of the diagram. And when we go to general relativity, we find exactly the same thing. We lower the temperature of our black hole below where it became superconducting. The bottom uh, curve is the one in the normal phase that we had before. And the three upper curves are all at lower temperature when you have um, a superconducting regime. The lines all agree on the right-hand side, and the slope is, again, just what's seen in the real materials. Now, I don't know how far we can take this. It really seems that general relativity is giving us a new tool to study these complicated materials. I mean, in my dreams, I imagine that general relativity might allow us to find a room temperature superconductor. This is really the holy grail of the field. Even the higher temperature superconductors have to be cooled quite a bit before they become superconducting. But a room temperature superconductor would revolutionize how we transport electricity. In this country, every year, about 7% of the electricity that's produced is lost in the transmission and distribution. Elsewhere in the world, that number is as high as 20%. A room temperature superconductor would allow us to transport electricity with almost 100% efficiency. And I just hope that perhaps someday general relativity will help us to find such a material. And I wonder what Einstein would think of that. Well, I'd like to thank my collaborators on this work. These are mostly my former students and postdocs. I couldn't have done it without them. Thank you.